All right, in today's video, we're going to talk about the basics of crossover distortion. And we're going to use the LM358 op amp uh, as an example. It's a very popular op amp. A crossover distortion occurs uh, often when the output stage of a circuit needs to switch between different modes of operation, uh, such as uh, sourcing or syncing current. Uh, in the case of, that I've got drawn here in this example, an AC coupled load could cause that to happen because uh, during the positive half cycle of any signal uh, the output stage will source current through the capacitor into the load but for the negative half cycle of a signal the uh, output needs to sync current from the load so switching between that source and sync in an AC coupled load situation can lead to crossover distortion depending on the design of the output stage that we're talking about. Similarly if uh, the output swing excursions go above or below the reference point for a load, even if it is DC coupled. That can also cause a switch between sourcing and sinking current. So let's first take a look at this and what I'm talking about. This is a very simple test circuit I've got set up on uh, the bench here. A function generator generating about a 1 volt peak to peak signal, in this case about 5 kilohertz. Just AC coupled into uh, a, the LM358 configured as a unity gain buffer and then these resistors are setting up a bias voltage of about 1.6, 1.7 volts or so uh, at the input here. So the input is swinging you know, plus and minus a half a volt around this 1.6 volt uh, input and that's what we'll get at the output if we DC couple the output. So I've got the breadboard configured so that I can have a jumper across the AC coupling so we can see what the output looks like when it's DC coupled and what happens when we remove the jumper and we're AC coupled. Let's uh, kind of speed the scope up here so we can kind of see what our signal looks like. So there's our sine wave. If we switch over to ground, we can see there's uh, where ground is. So we can see but in the DC coupled case, you know, we're, we're offset and we can actually see that one volt peak to peak signal without any difficulty. Now if we pull the jumper that's going across the output stage capacitor, we can now see uh, what that uh, signal looks like and we can see oh, there's a little bit of distortion in there. Let's uh, zoom in on that a little bit. But they uh, had 200 millivolts per division here we can actually see that crossover distortion occurring. Uh, as the positive half cycle when the output is sourcing current it looks fine and then there's a kind of a discontinuity in the waveform and then the negative half cycle picks up until we get about to ground again and then that happens again. So to understand why this is happening, let's take a look at the output stage schematic of the 358 op amp. So we'll break out the old uh, op amp data book from uh, 1993 from National Semiconductor. There's the, uh, the data sheets for the LM158, 258, 358, and 2904. And if we uh, scroll back here a couple of pages, we'll find the schematic for the op amp itself. So here's the simplified schematic for the uh, one stage of the LM358 op amp. And we'll just run through it really quick so you understand how it works. Uh, the uh, inputs are here, going through a pair of emitter followers into a PNP uh, emitter coupled pair. This is essentially the first amplifier. That's an actively loaded stage with a current source here. So we get some gain, a lot of gain from these inputs to this uh, output node right here. That's going into a PNP emitter follower or common collector amplifier. And then that is then going back and followed back down by an NPN emitter follower into a common emitter amplifier stage here that is actively loaded with this current source. So we essentially have two stages of voltage gain, the differential amp and Q12. Now this uh, Q12 common emitter stage drives the output transistors which are essentially Q13 and Q6. Q6 is driven by another essentially emitter follower Q5. We can see that Q5 and Q13 are tied to the same point uh, even though you know, so certainly these transistors and this transistor can't be on at the same time. So what happens is for situations where the output needs to source current this output will rise up and uh, turn on these two transistors and allow current to flow out of Q6 and out into the load. When the output needs to sync current, what's going to happen is you know that, that output starts to fall, eventually these transistors turn off and the output doesn't move anymore, so that th now this output has to swing very quickly from having these transistors on, going down to turn on 
at the base of Q13 so Q13 can start pulling current uh, from the output. So that time it takes to traverse the bias condition where these transistors are on down to the point where these are off and this transistor is on, that is where the distortion happens. We're crossing over between a you know a output sourcing situation to an output sinking situation. Now how quickly the Q12 can swing its collector to between those two states is going to be somewhat limited by the internal compensation capacitor. So there's going to be some finite time there when both output transistors are off and the output isn't doing anything. And that's what that's really what causes the crossover distortion that we see in the waveform. Okay, so now we can better understand what's going on with this output waveform. Uh, while we're sourcing current through the AC, the AC coupling capacitor into the load, those upper transistors are on. And then as soon as we get down towards ground and the output is going to start wanting to deliver current into the output stage, then those upper transistors turn off and we can see the, the output basically flattening out here because those transistors turn off. This is when the in amplifier internally is swinging that node on the collector of Q12 down to turn on the PNP uh, output uh, transistor. And then once that happens, the output quickly gets yanked down and then starts to follow the input again. Now, one interesting thing is if you look carefully, I'm going to expand this out a little bit, you'll notice that that flattening out of the waveform where those upper NPN transistors turn off is occurring just below ground. In fact, if I switch back to ground, you can see ground is right at the center radical, and this is this is actually going just a little bit below that. Well, how is that? You know, if that uh, that transistor you know can't sink any current, so why is that happening? Well, the key to that is this uh, 50 microamp current source that you see here. The 50 microamp current source is going to keep uh, Q5 and Q6 biased on a little bit longer until uh, we have to sync more than that more than that 50 microamps then these transistors turn off. So that's why the waveform is dipping just a little bit below ground uh, before those transistors uh, turn completely off. Now this actually gives us a little bit of a clue of how to alleviate the problem of crossover distortion. So to alleviate the problem of crossover distortion all we really need to try to do is to keep the output stage from switching between modes. Always have the output source current or always have it sync it. And that's kind of the effect that we saw here. We were sourcing current out of those transistors a little bit longer by providing a little bit of a load to those upper transistors. So if we provide a ground reference load in this case, DC load, ahead of the AC coupling capacitor, we can keep those PN or NPN output transistors always conducting and sourcing current this way. Uh, and never have the output state switch to sinking current because the current sink will be handled by the load resistor here. So let's take a look at that. I've got a jumper on the test board here that I can put into place and uh, I've got a, a 1K resistor and a 10K uh, potentiometer here so that we can take a look at the effect of varying the load here and the more current that we pull the more we can push that uh, crossover distortion out of the picture. All right, let's uh, address the trigger point up here so I can get a, a, bit, a better picture of the two points of crossover distortion here on the screen at the same time. And we'll install a jumper to uh, put that DC coupled load on the output stage. And even at, at 11K, which is the total here, we can actually see those two points of distortion have now actually dropped down. We're conducting a lot further below ground here. And if I start decreasing the value of the variable resistor we're increasing the amount of current that's going down to ground leaving those uh, output transistors on longer and longer and the further I drive that down the further I can drive that crossover distortion down into the bottom of the waveform and eventually completely eliminate it. So what we've done by making a smaller load resistor that's DC coupled to the negative uh, rail or in this case ground We've ensured that those upper transistors in the output stage are the only ones that are involved in uh, creating this waveform. So the output stage never switches state between sourcing and sinking current, it's always sourcing current. And that's the key for op amps like the LM358 to eliminate crossover distortion. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, short video to discuss uh, crossover distortion. 
uh, now understand a little bit more about the root cause of it and how the output structure of uh, the given op amp that you're using or whatever circuit that you're using can uh, result in some crossover distortion and in this particular case one way to alleviate that. Thanks again for watching. Comments are always welcome.